Two university students from distinct corners of the world share an unusual connection. Both of them vanish from the face of the earth without a trace mid-conversation during a phone call. They left behind nothing but silence and a trail of unanswered questions. Let's begin in the UK with David Plunkett, who was 21 years old in 2004, where he studied event management at Leeds University, while also working in some voluntary roles from box office to bar work. At the university itself, alongside his places of work, David would get to know the local community, and he was described as a bright, friendly, happy, and an outgoing young man. He was well liked, and nobody could believe the circumstances of his disappearance. On the night of the 17th of April 2004, David and one of his friends, Michael, found themselves on a mystery tour night around Manchester. At some point during that night, both he and Michael went to a Budweiser event at the Daytona Racetrack in Trafford Park. This was an invitation-only music festival, and saw DJs and bands playing, and as you can imagine, initially, they were having a great time. All the guests had six tokens that they could use to get drinks, but sources indicate that after a couple of the tokens were used, free drinks ended up just being given out. It seems that David and Michael both had too much to drink, and at some point, they had gotten separated and couldn't find one another. It's not completely clear what went on, but David ended up being thrown out by a security guard because it had too much. As David was leaving the music festival, this would be the last time he would ever be seen again. From what I can tell, I do not believe that Michael was even aware that David had been thrown out and was still trying to find David in the crowded festival. While on this now futile search, he made several phone calls to David, but each went unanswered. At 10 past 1 in the morning on the 18th, David's parents, Anne and Mike, who lived in Halifax, received a phone call from a now worried Michael stating that he and David had lost one another and that he just couldn't find him. David's mother reassured him and stated that she would essentially take over and start calling her son's phone. She was able to reach David at quarter past 1, I believe, so roughly 5 minutes from the call with Michael. The Manchester Evening News reported this. Mrs Plunkett said, We rang, and when David answered, he was incoherent. There was no noise in the background, and it struck me that he was on his own. Ten minutes into the phone call, he started screaming. He was howling and yelling. It was horrendous. Anne handed the phone to Mike and dialed the emergency services. But little could be done because they did not know where he was. They managed to keep the phone line open with David until half four in the morning, but there was no further contact. This, obviously, was highly unusual because as far as Anne was concerned, it was oddly quiet up until David became scared for some reason that has never been determined. She also said that at no point did she hear anyone else. So what in the world was happening, and what was David seeing? Just for some further context here, David's parents stated that he sounded confused, afraid, and obviously somewhat aggressive too. Apparently, he was swearing and using words that he hadn't used in front of them before. Ten minutes into the call, at 25 past one in the morning, he said to Anne, I'm turning right, turning right, turning right. Three times he said this before he broke out into the scream. He was still screaming as Mike was past the phone. Then once more, everything became deathly silent, despite the phone call still being connected. Again, to reiterate, no one else was heard for the duration of the call, when it ended at half four in the morning. Obviously, I suppose, his parents believed that he was being attacked. Though it's just bizarre that no one else was heard during this ordeal. Records with the phone call with Anne showed that he answered the phone somewhere between Salford Keys and the Old Trafford football ground. These locations are separated by the River Irwell, but a bridge on Trafford Road allows passage. David's parents stated that he sounded spaced out and not really with it. Mike described the scream as an unearthly howl, 
and that he'd never heard anything quite like it before. Again, what I find absolutely bizarre and puzzling about this was that as the parents described, there was no background noise at all. Anne said, the scream was so sudden and came out of nowhere. It was as if someone had startled him. It came right out of the blue. That's what scared me so much. I had never heard him scream and he had never sworn in front of me before. A major search effort was initiated, but nothing would be discovered until two weeks later on the 30th of April in the Manchester Ship Canal. David's body was found in an area that had already been searched. From what I can gather, the body was located near an Imperial Museum. Examiner Live reported, Home Office pathologist Dr John Rutherford said there was absolutely no evidence that David's passing was the result of foul play, and that the most likely cause was that of drowning. So first of all, most likely cause, so not definitively? Interesting. It was discovered that he was more than twice over the legal driving limit. I believe that David's friends believed that the drinks may have been tampered with. One of David's good friends said that he was usually a happy drinker, but this time, he was uncharacteristically aggressive and annoyed. Interestingly, David's phone was later found upstream of the body by David's uncle, despite the extensive search by the authorities. I'm not sure if it was in the water or on land. If the phone call started at 1.20am and he started screaming 10 minutes into the call, and the phone line remained open until 4.30am, I'm going to assume that the phone was found on land and never entered the water. I'm not sure how that makes any sense, but I doubt the phone would have survived for three hours submerged in the river. But then was saying that somehow he entered the water and the phone did not, so he dropped it beforehand? If that was the case, it also doesn't make sense that the police search missed the phone initially and it was only found after the body was discovered. Was it placed there then? None of that really makes sense to me. A coroner's inquest was held a year after this incident took place in April of 2005. The coroner recorded a verdict stating that it was an accidental drowning and that there was no evidence of foul play or substance abuse. Does that mean that there was no evidence that the drinks had been tampered with then? And it was a case of simply having far too much? Mike and Anne disagreed with this assessment. Mike stated that something had terrified him. He was on the phone, but he could not speak to us. And that wasn't because he'd had too much to drink. Anne added, the screaming and howling was so unearthly, we just thought it had to be something. So let's just get this straight. David's talking with Anne for 10 minutes and then suddenly bursts into this unearthly howl. Were the police really saying that that was just nothing? There may not have been any direct or physical evidence left behind of foul play, but I'd certainly argue that a terrified and prolonged scream might point to something untoward and unexpected happening, no? The circumstances laid out are just not gelling together at all. What on earth even happened here? Good actual lord, I'm glad I'm not on my own with that assessment because the former detective, Chief Superintendent, Tony Blockley, also found the circumstances utterly bizarre, adding that he had questioned as to whether David might have been chased or lured to his final location. He also stated that if David had fallen into the water, the parents should have heard an obvious splash from the phone had that taken place. They heard no such thing. In fact, other than this unearthly howl, as described, they didn't hear anything at all. No cars, no one else shouting or running, just a disturbing silence given the circumstances. Obviously unsatisfied with the verdict, Anne and Mike stated that there were just too many questions left unanswered. The circumstances surrounding this incident, the cause of David's distress and what happened to him remains unknown. Now, let's move on to the United States of America. Dan Zamlin was 18 years old at the time while enrolled at the University of St. Thomas. Dan was said to be quite successful for his age. He was an intelligent young man that was very athletic too. He was also an Eagle Scout, and while we usually cover disappearances from rural and wilderness areas, 
this skill set he held wouldn't play much of a role in this scenario, as Dan didn't disappear from the wilderness, but rather from Minnesota's state capital, St. Paul. Dan vanished on the 5th of April, 2009, but before that, we have to go back to the night before on the 4th. Dan was out partying with a group of his friends, not far from the campus, down St. Clair Avenue. This was just supposed to be a fun-filled night together, full of drinking and laughter, but it seems that Dan may have had a little too much that night, as he reportedly got upset at the party in the early hours of the 5th. It's not clear what he was upset at, but he would leave the group at approximately 2am, unfortunately not telling anyone that he was departing. Dan found himself walking along the Mississippi River Boulevard next to St. Clair Avenue on a trail. There was a grassy area next to the trail and a wooded slope. Reports state that he was heading towards the university to meet with some of the friends. At this time, one of his friends from the party, Anna, realized that he'd left and called his phone. This was approximately 2.30 in the morning, where Anna asked where he was and that she would come pick him up. The plan, I believe, was for Anna to come and get him and the two would drive back to her place. Witnesses stated that Dan was incoherent before the time he'd left, so it's not clear just how much understanding or control Dan actually had over himself at this point. Dan's location was west of the party and Anna began driving towards him. On the phone, she told him that she couldn't quite see him and to look out for her headlights. This is where things take a turn. As Anna was trying to find him, suddenly, and while Anna did not later remember the exact wording, but in essence, Dan's final words to her would be something along the lines of, oh my gosh, where are you, help. During this call for help, some kind of event had obviously taken place, though it's not clear what he saw or what was happening. But we do know that he must have become separated from the phone because Anna stated that his cry for help became increasingly distant, as if he was getting further and further away from the phone. At this point, contact with Dan was lost and the call ended, though the phone remained on. Anna must have told Dan's family because it was stated that Anna, other friends of Dan's and his family were out looking for him and repeatedly attempting to make contact through the phone but were only getting through to his voicemail. His phone would eventually run out of battery at 8.30 a.m., which is when the authorities were notified. The search for Dan was massive, and over 1,000 volunteers joined the effort to help look for him. Alongside the authorities, people flocked to the river and were walking up and down the banks. When this effort continued to fail, sonar scans were then deployed in the hopes of determining his location in the water which also revealed nothing. Bloodhounds were also brought to Dan's last known location, but there was no scent trail for Dan. There were other scent trails, which we'll get to later. Helicopters with infrared flew overhead. Water patrol checked along the shore. Friends and family searched in culverts, brush, trees, and valleys. And the University of St. Thomas organized a block by block, door to door search. Police did find a footprint leading away from the river in the direction of the road, but they could not say for certain that it belonged to Dan. Over the next 27 days that he was missing, more than 1,200 people searched for Dan Zamlin. This footprint was found in the area that Dan was last believed to be. Despite this, and given the search effort, I think it's rather clear that the authorities' conclusion was that Dan must have fallen into the water. Another interesting fact was that the search was terminated four days into it. That is very weird to me. Usually these searches extend over weeks, not days. I couldn't confirm this for certain, but Sally Zamlin, Dan's mother, reportedly stated that she was told by a senior commander, your son was a very troubled young man. We'll find him when the river gives him up. We don't have the time to look for him. We have 100 missing person cases a week. Good actual lord, if that's true and that was actually said, I can't even imagine how the family must have felt. I've no idea how anyone could be so insensitive in this situation given the circumstances on what's just occurred. While the official search seems to have been called off after four days for some reason, as said, 
For nearly a month, others continued on, but all search efforts kept turning up nothing and no leads over and over again until the 1st of May. The Ford Motor Plant is situated on the Mississippi River, south of the university. There, he was found floating in the river by an employee of the plant roughly a mile away from where he'd vanished. Just like David Plunkett, he hadn't sustained any injuries at all, and thus, there was nothing to suggest that he had taken a fall down the rocky embankment. This area had been repeatedly searched over a month's period, and now, there he was. The initial coroner's report couldn't even determine a cause of passing. It seems that the authorities were nevertheless rather quick to write it off as an accidental drowning, despite any real evidence to this effect other than the presence of alcohol in his system. They declared it an unfortunate accident, and that was that. Dan's family, friends, and classmates immediately challenged the official version of events, and accused them of not only bungling the case, but also attacking Dan's character when reports were released suggesting that this may have been a purposeful act by Dan due to an identity crisis. Dan's family were clearly not satisfied with the way the investigation had been done, nor their conclusions, and you can see why. The coroner never stated just how long he believed Dan's body had actually been in the water, Sally poured through hundreds of pages of reports and would find a wide range of inconsistencies, dropped balls, and evidence that disputed the official police report. She was the one who would determine that the coroner had found no injuries. She would also find that much of the police investigation hinged on witnesses who were problematic. There were inconsistencies in the statements made by those who last saw Dan and phone records that do not match up with witnesses' statements that he'd had too much to drink and was incoherent. Many said that he was in good spirits and hadn't had too much at all. Unhappy with the inconsistencies, Dan's family called for a second autopsy to be done, and this second attempt found that there was a presence of GHB in the liver that was higher than normal levels. Sally said she'd found out that Dan and others had a funny tasting drink at the party, which apparently made him and others ill. Sally wonders if it was this drink that was responsible for the high levels of GHB, which can lead to dizziness, loss of muscle control, and consciousness. Dan was also diabetic, and apparently GHB can provoke a health episode in such people. The ultimate point Sally was making in the end was that she does not believe that this was an accident as the coroner had concluded. One of Dan's friends, Courtney Anderson, had this to say about Dan. I have always known Dan to be a careful person. He had a good head on his shoulders, and I just find it startling that the autopsy came back as an accidental passing. It just doesn't seem to me that the puzzle pieces are really fitting correctly. The authorities were then criticised for their search effort and their inability to find Dan in the first place, even with sonar scans. It's not clear to me though that Dan was even in the water at the time of the search, which we'll get to in a moment. And the police did state that they had no idea when or at what position he even actually entered the water and stated that's something we may never know. Sally wrote an email to a journalist who had apparently written an unsavoury article about Dan. In the article, she relayed a number of interesting findings that she'd uncovered. Here are just some of them. Fact, drowning victims usually surface 6 to 10 days after drowning. Fact, the river was flowing 400 times faster than usual and was flowing 4 feet over the dam yet Dan's body only travelled two miles and didn't surface for 27 days. Fact, Dan's insulin pod was still attached. If the river was flowing so quickly, it does seem unlikely that the body had only travelled a couple of miles and hadn't surfaced for 27 days. That very much could indicate that he wasn't in the river for the entire time. Of course, he could have got snagged beneath the surface, but at that speed, it seems that he should have been much further along than he actually was. Fact, the St. Paul Police Department ruled out the river on April 9. Fact, cadaver dogs had four hits in the river and four bodies were found while Dan was missing. It's interesting that initially, the authorities had concluded that he hadn't gone into the water. 
I wonder if that had something to do with the footprint. It's not clear to me exactly why they ruled out the river initially. Fact, two coroners determined that my son had no injuries to suggest a fall or jump into the river. Fact, the Ramsey medical examiner could not determine 100% that Dan did in fact drown, only that he was found in the water. I must admit, with everything I've heard, I do lean towards the idea that he was not in the river for the entire time he was missing. Though how he actually vanished, and the means of which he did enter the water, I have no idea. I do believe that the family were thoroughly in the foul play camp, and believe that a third party was involved, and you can certainly see why they feel that way. Here's some final information on this. During the testimony before the House of Representatives, Dale, Dan's father, said that he believed Dan was taken he said that although the missing persons unit quickly zoned in on the river area, other facts seemed to rule out the river. He noted that eight bloodhounds had searched the area two or three days after he disappeared and kept stopping in the same place but did not go near the river. He also said that side scanning sonar had been used to search the river as well as infrared. He also said that he works as a pit miner and walked through the area and did not feel that someone would easily slip there, and if they did, it would leave a mark. Nothing was in the area where Dan was found. Realistically, if he'd have fallen in, surely you'd expect to find some kind of evidence of a slide down the embankment, but of course, this was never found. It's also interesting that eight separate bloodhounds had stopped at the same place that wasn't near the river, as Dale said. Could that have been the exact spot where he was taken then? And if so, taken how exactly? In what manner? What do you think happened here? Was this an accident as the authorities seem to conclude in the end, or something more? I'm going to end this video now and hand it over to you in the comments below. I'd just like to take the time to thank you for watching and a big thank you to the patrons who've been running around on the screen. If you found the video interesting, then please do leave a like, hit the bell, and subscribe if you haven't already, it helps me a lot. If not, then feel free to leave a dislike, I'm just looking for your honest opinion either way. I hope that you've had a great day, or evening, depending on where you are, and I'll see you in the next one. Be safe guys, peace.